for those who have uh, joined us, we'll just wait a minute or two while people are uh, entering the webinar and we'll, um, we'll get started in a minute or two. Just a minute or two more, just uh, waiting for the numbers to come in. Okay, we might um, we might get started. I think um, so. Welcome everyone, and um, good evening. My name's Jeff Minchin, senior ag advisor with local land services, working in uh, the drought adoption officer program, and I will be your host again tonight. Um, following the, the previous two weeks that we've uh, we've had these webinars, uh, welcome and thank you for um, taking time to join us for for a very topical session that's. Um, involving feeding sheep in dry times with um with jeff duddy from sheep solutions who's coming to us from sunny queensland this afternoon um just to uh just before we start i would like to acknowledge that we're all dialing in from what was and what always will be aboriginal land i pay my respects to the wiradjuri people who are the traditional owners and custodians of the land and waters on which i am standing on today and also extend that to the traditional custodians you are all representing today, as well as elders past, present and emerging. This webinar is part of a series brought to you by our LLS Saving Our Soils During Drought Program. Local Land Service has been hosting a number of webinars for livestock producers across the state to assist in decision making and management of their livestock through the current dry period, particularly in the northern part of the state and the east. Uh, other webinars in this series uh, include um, feeding cattle in dry times with Jeff House, which is next Wednesday. Um, and following that, we'll also cover off the week after on early weaning with Brett Littler and um, potentially some others to follow um, after that. Uh, we'll um, endeavour to uh, send out the, the live the flyer with the email of the recording, um, which will come through tomorrow and uh, you feel free to register for those future events and stay uh, stay tuned to what we might have coming. As we go through tonight, uh, if you've got any questions, please place your questions in the questions tab on the control panel um, and we will try to address those either as we go through during the night or um, at the end. Uh, we'll try to wrap up the, the final questions at the end. So um, tonight, Jeff Duddy is from his own private company, Sheep Solutions. Uh, so Jeff's gonna cover off on designing a ration, uh, types of feeds and feeding methods and animal health. What are the, some of the main things to watch out for um, during the dry time and um, when you're uh, feeding sheep. Jeff has spent over 20 years servicing regional, state and national sheep and wool producer inquiries, specialising in sheep, meat, production, new and introduced sheep breeds, pasture and grain based finishing systems and marketing. So welcome Jeff. Yeah, thanks Jeff. How's everyone going? Good I hope. Um, I hope so. 
it's, it's unfortunate that we're back in dry times and we need to go through this sort of webinar series, but um, hopefully people will get something out of it. Um, thanks, Jeff. So if I'm right to go. You're right to go, and I'm going to just shoot my, turn my camera off for a moment and you can fire away. Okay, mate, no worries. Um, again, welcome everyone. Jeff gave a bit of a brief um, rundown of my background. I spent most of my working life in New South Wales DPI. Last uh, seven, eight years I've been based in Southern Queensland as a private consultant. So I'm more than happy to help out where anyone has any, any questions. Um, we will have questions towards the end of the um, presentation. And if you do need to stop us halfway through or at a certain point, yeah, just uh, by all means do so. Just, um, sorry, just the first couple of slides here, there is a uh, guide to confinement feeding sheep and cattle that uh, Jeff House, myself and Brett Littler put together last year, um, which is pretty well an A to Z for confinement feeding sheep and cattle. It can be downloaded from the website. There's the uh, web address there. And two very good resources, um, feeding and managing sheep in dry times, which is a collaborative DAFWA or Department of Ag, WA and PERSA in South Australia. Um, an older book now, but it has some very good information. Um, and also New South Wales uh, DPI's Managing Drought Booklet. So they're very good resources that you can actually access um, if you need to. Um, and I would recommend that you do so. Just some really quick basics um, for how sheep differ from cattle. Um, and relates a little bit to how we go about uh, and why we actually look at um, formulating rations a little bit different with sheep than we do with cattle. Um, feed tends to pass quicker through the rumen in sheep. They spend half the time eating compared to cattle, but they spend almost four times longer chewing. Now that's particularly important when it comes to production of saliva and bicarb, uh, which we'll talk about as we go through. They spend more time resting or ruminating, um, chewing that cut and that sort of thing. And interestingly, they, they tend to have a higher incidence of gut issues. So it's particularly important that we keep fibre contents up um, when we're feeding sheep grain in particular, um, particularly those high starchy grains like wheat or triacali. In terms of feed requirements, um, requirements are based on an animal's relevant dry sheep equivalent or DSC status. Now that's defined as a, the amount of feed required by a two year old 50 kilogram dry sheep to maintain its weight or condition. So we base everything against that standard. One DSC requires 8.3 megajoules of energy per day on a dry matter base. And I'll give you a few examples of how much grain we need to feed um, or loosen we need to feed, the example I'm going to use, to meet that requirement as we go through. Conception, pregnancy, birth, right through to weaning and survival of, you know, of lambs and the like, all heavily dependent on making sure that ewe's in good body condition and meeting the feed needs of that ewe and the lambs. Um, so we need to know the physiological state um, or productive state of, of our animals that we're feeding. Um, we need to sort of look at our energy and protein needs and balancing those up. And to a lesser degree, we need to sort of look, look at our um, vitamins and minerals. Um, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about those towards the end of the presentation. Just rehashing, we have here in Australia two systems of monitoring condition or body condition uh, of animals. One is the fat scoring site, which is the 12th rib. This is basically the information you get back when you sell something direct to an avatar. The other one is condition scoring site, which is over the loin area, uh, where we're basically looking at feeling the backbone, um, how fleshed out the eye muscle area is, and how much fat cover is over the short ribs. And no doubt most people are aware of what the condition scoring is all about, but it's quite a simple process. As I said, it's a way of just manipulating um, over the loin area and those short ribs, just feeling how much fat cover. Um, and importantly for the eye muscle area, how fleshed out that is, because it's a really good indicator for how that animal's been traveling in the last two to four uh, weeks. 
Um, and importantly, that eye muscle is a very good energy source. And, and pregnant ewes in particular that are under a bit of nutritional stress will tend to draw um, down on that eye muscle. Um, and so we need to look at what sort of reserve we've got on hand prior to starting to feed. If we're looking just simply at uh, the one to five condition scoring um, sort of scale, if you run your hand over the end of your uh, your fingers, um, that's basically what a one condition score animal would feel like at the um, edge of its loin or, or, or short ribs. Uh, you run over the fleshy top part of your palm and that's pretty well what a three condition score animal is. Um, and if you go at the base of your hand where you really can't feel any bone at all, that's a condition five type animal. There's no way of actually testing your accuracy on this. Uh, it doesn't really worry me as long as you're relative and you can actually look and identify those animals that are down in condition and therefore need to be fed um, and can hopefully um, divide up based on that condition score and that can actually save you a lot of feed. If you have animals that are in reasonable condition, say forward score, forward store condition, two and a half, three condition score, um, they may not need to be fed as much. Um, or fed at all, uh, depending on your current pa uh, pasture base. Regardless of the um, class of sheep, pretty well we target a condition score three. We'd love to see them running in a condition score three throughout the year. Um, it is actually more economical for you to maintain an animal in that condition, uh, whether it's two and a half or three condition score, than to let them slip and then to have to build um, body back on that animal, condition back on that animal. Just some basics when it comes to digestion and the rumen in particular. What we're actually doing is, is feeding the bugs in the rumen. So we really want a stable environment. We want to make sure that we're providing enough energy and protein and the like for those bugs to actually thrive and to produce products. <clears throat> those bugs in the rumen, they, they actually digest things like cellulose, sugar and starch, okay, all the energy components. Of feed, they produce byproducts um, of fermentation, things called volatile fatty acids, which we'll talk a little bit about in a second. Ammonia, carbon dioxide, and methane. They synthesize amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein, okay? Um, vitamin Bs and Ks, and they're a major protein source themselves when they are washed down through the rest of the digestive system. So we want to try and keep this whole room and um, See, uh, rumen environment sort of working well. Basically what happens with sheep and cattle, um, particularly with sheep though, food swallowed with minimal chewing initially. Chewing stimulates the production of saliva and saliva contains sodium, potassium, phosphate, bicarbonate and urea. It contains enzymes for the breakdown of fat and starch. It helps to buffer the pH or acid levels within the rumen. So I'll just go back one. Um, and so we want to actually keep that whole production system going. And, and to stimulate that, we've got to stimulate chewing. Sheep will chew in a normal pasture situation around 30 to 40,000 times a day. Now, that's not just taking a bite 30,000 times, that's chewing the cud and the like. While ever they're doing that, they're producing saliva and they're producing bicarb, which is going to help keep that rumen acid levels in check, which is particularly important when it comes to feeding grains like our cereal grains, which tend to be higher in starch. What we want to do is actually retain a fibre mat, floating fibre mat on top of the rumen. I'm, I'm really, really big. I know, I know fibre, roughage, um, hay, silage, whatever, is very expensive when it, we come into dry times. Uh, but I would always advocate that we keep at least 10% effective fibre, so that's fibre that will stimulate the rumen. Uh, the, the hard short particles that are going to actually stimulate the inside of the rumen walls, help with the release of all the digestive juices and the like. We want at least a 10% minimum for sheep. So ballpark figures say a sheep is eating a kilogram of feed a day, 100 grams of that I'd like to see is some sort of roughage, whether it's from the pasture, or if you're providing that roughage. Fibre has a lot of different roles. Yep, it stimulates cud chewing and saliva production. 
um, diverts phosphorus from urine into the manure, and that helps improve the calcium phosphorus balance in the urine, uh, which is particularly important for those who might have had issues with bladder stones or water belly or urolithiasis, which we'll talk about um, because of that imbalance with calcium and phosphorus, which all cereal grains or all pulses, all our meals, everything is low in calcium relative to phosphorus. Importantly, it, it slows down gut flow, so we're getting more bang for our buck, so the feed's in the, in the rumen for longer. Um, it increases B12 absorption. B12 is needed for energy production. Provides additional vitamin D. Vitamin D is important when it comes to calcium mobilisation and use. Improves magnesium availability and absorption. Magnesium is one of those macro minerals that I think we, we don't take enough notice of. It has a lot of similar roles as calcium. Um, it's needed for energy production and it's also needed for nerves. And for those who are looking, who may have um, lambing use and the like, fibre helps increase milk fat. So it's got to be in the system. Having said that, you know, why we want this effective fibre, that little bit of roughage and the like that's going to stimulate the inside of the rumen, we can feed grain alone to sheep. Right? I prefer not to. Again, I prefer to see roughage in there, but I'll just explain why when feeding to sheep, we can just feed grain. What happens when a sheep takes a mouthful of grain, 70% of that grain initially is swallowed whole. So we have all these little bits of whole grain, um, you know, one to two millimetres in length in the rumen that are acting like little bits of roughage. So it works um, that way. We can actually use that and we just need to keep going and stimulating that, that cud chewing process and make sure that we have enough buffering um, additives in there, in particular, if you're not feeding roughage. So we're not going to run into problems with um, the rapid sort of breakdown of starch and acidosis or grain poisoning. The normal situation in the rumen, we have all these volatile fatty acids. So we have acetic acid and butyric acid. The normal pH of the rumen is around 6.8 or 7, so the left-hand side of this screen. If we um, feed grain, particularly grain high in starch, what will happen um, even if we do it in slowly, and in introduction period is only slow, that will change over the sort of percentage of these different um, volatile fatty acids. And we have more and more propionic acid being produced, um, which is a great glucose precursor, so it's a great energy source. And what happens is that we'll see a drop down in the pH within the rumen. When that happens, though, if we aren't controlling it, if we haven't got a good handle of it, um, we can end up with a, an issue called subclinical acidosis where you may not actually see any deaths or scouring the like, but you'll have production loss. And if it continues um, and we keep having lower and lower pH within that room, and well, that helps all those lactic acid producing bugs to suddenly rapidly um, multiply and keep producing more and more acid. And we end up with a, pro, a problem called clinical acidosis, and that's where we really do have issues. That's where we see real damage to the inside lining of the rumen, um, dehydration, scouring, and usually death of the animal. So what we need to do is try and keep our pH in a normal pH, sorry, our rumen in a normal pH sort of range as much as possible. We do that by introducing grain slowly and I know there are programs out there where you can actually get animals or sheep on grain quite quickly, but um, if you don't follow them to the T and you have a hiccup, you can have big problems. And I'll always advocate that we follow this sort of process where, you know, the introducing grain, you might only start at 50 grams a head for the first day or two. Day three and four, you double that to 100 grams and so on until you get to the actual um, amount that you need to be feeding each animal. Do it slowly, keep it simple, use the KISS principle. In terms of frequency of feeding, I would prefer to see, yeah, feeding daily, um, but I'm just obviously aware of um, issues on farm with labour and time and the like. But certainly younger stock, lambs and weaners, I would prefer to see them fed daily. Late pregnant or lactating use the same. Um, if you are in that stage, I would actually prefer to see late pregnant or lactating ewes on self-feeders. 
have those self feeders actually spread out in the paddock, block off underneath the feeders because young lambs will camp in the shade um, and mum will walk away without one. Um, other sheep like dry sheep or ewes up to the last couple of weeks of pregnancy, you can probably feed two to three times a week, so every second to third day. The biggest issue I have with that is if you are feeding cereal grains, particularly something like wheat, which is high in starch, um, it only takes say two days for the bugs in the gut to go back to the normal sort of pattern and then if we hit them again with a slug of starch or wheat well then we've got that issue of acidosis sort of cropping its head up and and it's a cyclical type thing where they'll be doing okay and then we hit slug them again you know three days after they got the last feed so I would rather to see feeding more regularly just to really minimize that risk of acidosis. How often you do feeds really up to the state or the stage of the animal, the uh, physiological needs, the type of feed you're feeding. If you're feeding hay, yeah, it won't really matter if you don't feed out, you know, if you only feed once a week, as long as there's feed there. Your labour, um, where you stand on farm and what sort of setup you have, whether you have feeding out in the paddocks or you're in a confinement area. Um, your capacity of your troughs and self feeders, and I would dearly love to see everyone use some sort of troughing. Um, and we cover that pretty well in, in that confinement feeding manual, uh, the reasons for doing so. Um, and the risk of feed losses, um, the conditions out there, birds or other animals and that sort of thing sort of getting in and, and that actually contributing to loss of, of grain depending on how often you feed out. What I like to do when, particularly when looking in confinement areas or, or feedlot areas is first thing I do is actually check the uh, manures. Um, if the animals are sitting down nice and quiet and alike and you have about 40% or more of chewing the cud, that's the first indicator that generally fibre levels will be okay. But by checking the manures and we look at the three C's, the colour, consistency and content. Just to give you some examples, on our left hand side of the screen there, that's what we commonly see in a paddock situation. Um, that generally points to a poor quality diet, low in protein um, and energy, um, and usually high in fibre. So that pellet and sort of um, medium form is, is probably not the best. One we probably would most likely like to see would be the one in the centre, um, a stacked pat sort of solid, something with the consistency of um, wheat picks. If you start to see some grain and the like um, going through, uh, with the manure, don't be, don't necessarily be worried. It could indicate that we need to slow the gut down a bit more and get some more roughage into the system. But more often than not, that gut, that grain has been processed. If, however, we see manures like that on the right hand side, and we see bubbles or mucus casts um, or a really grey, smelly, runny manure, um, then we've got problems with, you know, high in gut um, fermentation issues or acidosis issues. Um, and yeah, we need to correct that. So checking manure is a good way of seeing um, what sort of, uh, how they're traveling in terms of gut health and in particular, whether or not we have enough roughage in the system. How do we go about calculating what we need to feed? It really depends on the live weight, feed quality and the class of stock and their stage of production. In general, with sheep and cattle as a percentage of their live weight, I'll consume on dry, dry pasture or poor quality feed, so pretty much, or even stubbles and the like, you know, about one and a half to two percent of their live weight. That's sort of a maximum they're able to actually consume. Average quality pasture or hay, two and a half to three percent. If they're in, excuse me, if they're in a confinement or feedlot area, they may eat upwards of five percent or so of their live weight, particularly if there is low roughage content. Um, and a high grain content in the ration. Generally for maintenance, um, and we're really looking at dry sheep and the like here, we wouldn't try and maintain lambs or um, pregnant or lactating ewes. We really want them going forward, but for maintenance, budget on around one and a half to 2% of their live weight is what they need to eat a day. There are some different ways of actually calculating what they do need. Um, Lifetime U has a really good system uh, that we use during the workshops for working out feed requirements and the like based on not only condition score but also stage of production. 
Um, that managing drought booklet from New South Wales DPI has a couple of graphs for sheep and cattle in it, where you can actually draw lines through the quality of the feed that you're feeding, and it'll tell you, depending on your class of stock, how much you need to feed. But as a rough rule of thumb, somewhere around 2% of their live weight is what they'll need for maintenance. And to give you a bit of an idea, on the right hand side there we've got barley, 90% dry matter, and just remember all feeds are compared on a dry matter base. So as if all energy, uh, sorry, all moisture is taken out. That barley is 12 megs of energy. Um, sheep, a 50 kilogram ewe or dry animal at one DSC needs 750 grams of that barley to maintain condition or condition score three. Okay. The loosen on the left hand side is 33% dry matter. So two thirds of this loosen is water. 10 megs of energy. That bag holds 1,250 grams or 1.25 kilos. To get the same amount of energy as that bag of grain, a sheep needs to eat two of those bags of loosen. So we come in there, an issue comes in there of gut fill, okay? And the amount of moisture and the bulkiness of the feed and the like. So physically, particularly for late pregnant or lactating animals, getting that amount of feed into the system is really hard. That's why we advocate feeding grains more often than not for those animals. Okay, just on energy. It's the most important indicator of feed quality. I mean, a lot of people will say coming into a drought that protein's the most important. It's not. Energy is the most important. Protein is important and it's important to balance up the two. But energy is needed for things like muscle development, putting down fat, maintaining an animal and growth. It's measured in megajoules of energy per kilogram of dry matter. So MJ, ME slash KG dry matter, okay? And again, all feeds are tested and compared on a dry matter base. Feed test energy values are related to digestibility. So the digestibility of the feed actually relates back to And oil component. Your carbohydrates, you start, I mean, that can sort of 15 to 18. And just to give you a bit of a negative kilogram of energy that they generate every time that the start they actually generate, you'll see that protein is actually a higher energy source. And protein can be used, excess protein can be used as an energy protein form. Okay, so don't be feeding pulses. We look at the prices. Not that they're not compared to feeding cereal grains, and we got anywhere near the risk like acidosis when we're feeding pulses. Um, the health and use as a key form, and that excess protein used as an energy. Oil, oil is a really good energy source. All with a ration is. Um, beyond that, we tend to have problems with the bugs in the gut and the like, and uh, and we don't perform as well. That's unfortunately, I mean, one of the great feeds, um, alternate feeds at the moment, is, um, is is cotton seed. It's quite expensive, unfortunately, but you know they'll self-limit on that because they'll reach that seven to eight percent total oil in the ration or their diet, and uh, they'll they'll self-limit on intake of cotton seed. You can use things to compare on an energy. Uh, or cost per energy or protein base. This is the DPI's New South Wales DPI feed cost calculator. And I've just done a few scenarios here. We've put barley at $350 a ton and 12 megajoules of energy, 11% protein. Lupins at 450, 13 megs of energy, 32% protein. And cotton seed at $700, 13 megs and 20% protein. And what that will do, you can actually compare here on a weight base, on a dry matter base, um, the cost per unit of energy and protein. So you can start to you know, compare different feed sources for their energy value and protein value. And that's particularly important when we get into a full blown drought um, and every cent counts. When we're looking at actual requirements, um, I'll quickly run you through this. I know a lot of people in southern <clears throat> New South Wales um, will be looking more at weaning and we'll talk about weaning towards the end of today. Um, than they are at lambing, but 
just quickly, if we're looking here, this blue line here is our dry sheep's requirement, which is 8.3 megs. At the point of lambing, single bearing ewe needs one and a half times the energy of a dry sheep. A twin bearing ewe needs two and a half times the energy, so it's got to consume two and a half times the feed um, a dry sheep does. And importantly, at the peak of lactation, we're looking at up to three and a half times the feed requirement. So physically getting pasture and the like, even if we've got good quality pasture there, into the animal, it's really difficult. Protein, it's estimated from the amount of nitrogen that's in the feed, it's needed for muscle development, it's needed for appetite. If we don't have enough protein going into the rumen, um, the whole thing will slow down, right? It's also needed for wool production, which is a no-brainer. Sheep basically need to start with a minimum of about 7% crude protein in their diet for maintenance. So if we're looking at running animals on stubbles at this time of year, more than likely we're going to be protein deficient. Um, energy, yeah, they may be picking up reasonable energy um, by spilt grain, but um, because our stubbles in particular are so clean these days, um, weed, weed wise and that sort of thing, the actual uh, amount of protein they're able to harvest from that is, is minimal. So um, and dry feed over summer, same thing. Um, protein should be limiting, I'd say, would be starting to be limiting. So I mentioned before, we want to try and balance up energy and protein for optimum growth rates and production. Ballpark figures for survival, a 50 kilogram or one DSE animal needs around about eight megs of energy and about 7% protein. Lactation and late pregnancy, energy and protein both increased. For growth, we look for at least 10 megajoules of energy in intake um, or in the ration, hopefully 12 to 13 to really push growth rates. My rough rule of thumb for younger stock, um, you know, 30 to 40 kilogram lambs is whatever their energy intake is, add two to three and that'll be the protein need. So if it's 12 megs of energy, they'll need 14 to 15% protein. If they're smaller or, or lighter stock, like early wean lambs, we're probably looking at 18% plus protein is what they'll need. So we really need to get some good quality feed into those if we are looking at weaning those lambs early. Very quickly on grains, I'm not gonna step you through what I normally do with the tables that I'll show here, but um, for sheep, there's generally no advantage to crack or roll the cereal grains, it's just an additional cost. Sheep are that good at cracking that grain as long as we stimulate that cub chewing. Cattle, however, would benefit from some degree of processing grains. Um, just a really slight crack. Um, uh, you don't want to go too fine with it because what you can actually do is open up the starch in the grain to, um, to the bugs for greater access and, and you'll have an increase in sort of starch being broken down and the pH dropping in the rumen and acidosis. It's important just to slowly introduce that grain as we showed before to allow the rumen to adapt to that change and by all means we'll be using a couple of additives and I'll take you through some of those in a minute. In terms of all our different grains we've got our main cereal grains at the top here. We have peas, beans and lupins, our pulses sort of towards the bottom. The general rule of thumb for acidosis risk those at the top of the screen tend to be higher in starch and lower in fibre. So they are higher risk when it comes to grain poisoning or acidosis. Corn is an interesting one. It's probably the highest when it comes to starch, but a lot of the starch in corn is actually like bypasses the rumen. You've, you've heard of bypass protein. Well, we also have bypass starch. And a lot of the starch for corn and sorghum will bypass it. Uh, the rumen and be broken down and utilised in the small intestine. When that happens, you get about 40% more bang for your buck. So to my mind, the feed test will say corn's around 13 megs of energy, but the actual value is probably about 17 megajoules. So corn's quite a good feed energy-wise in particular. These ones at the bottom, down lower here, are lower in starch, higher in fibre, higher in oil. So a lot of the energy for, say from lupins, very little is actually coming from starch. A lot of it's coming from sugars and, and oil component. So that's why lupins is the safer of those feeds. Okay, in terms of minerals, um, 
by all means, you can go with blocks and licks and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm generally hard on those, to be honest, because they cost a lot of money. Of the major minerals, calcium, sodium, phosphorus and magnesium are the most important, and you can pretty well provide those as your own in, in your own loose licks. If you can get a mineral analysis done of any ration um, or diet, that, that's good, um, to make sure that we're actually meeting minimal sort of requirements, but that's reasonably costly and most people would work on average sort of mineral content of the grains and the like and, and go from there. So what I would like to see in terms of adding things like acid buff or bicarb or limestone, which we're going to talk about now, is I'd love to see it go in on the grain. We know then that anything that eats the grain will be getting those minerals. I fully understand the issues people have with putting lime and salt and that sort of thing in self feeders and the issues they can cause. One little trick you, you may be able to use is to make a slurry up of, of the additives. So just adding a bit of water to things like your bicarb and your lime, if you're using those, for example, and your salt. Make it up like a, a runny slurry. Work out your flow rate of your auger and then add um, our mineral mix at about 2%, so you know, 20 kilos of mix to a tonne, or 20 kilos of each of the additives to, to, to a tonne of grain. Okay, look, acid buff. Acid buff is probably used by about 90% of the pellet manufacturers now. It's actually a seaweed extract. It's a, the best buffer really out there. It buffers four times better than bicarb and it buffers for longer. Um, it also has the advantage of releasing calcium and magnesium into the room, and so we can actually use acid buff in lieu of putting in things like lime or cause mag. Um, it's reasonably expensive, but you use it at a lower rate of around about one to one and a half percent or 10 to 15 kilos per tonne of grain. Bentonite, it's not actually a buffer per se. It's, um, it's a clay and it swells in size when it hits the room in fluids. And a lot of the acid ions will bind to the outside of it um, and then go out in the, um, in the manure. Um, bicarb of soda, we've already touched on that. That's the natural way a sheep or cow will try and actually minimise or mitigate any issues with acid sort of being formed in the stomach. Naturally produced when stocked at chewing. Um, it's reasonably expensive. I, I would normally recommend if people use it, to only use it for the first two weeks. And by that time, we've generally got them up to a full ration. Um, and you can use it in lieu of putting so, uh, salt in there for a while because it's sodium bicarbonate. Um, but we do need to have salt. I haven't listed salt here, but all our cereal grains are, are low in calcium and low in sodium. So, yeah, we need to include some salt in that diet. Limestone. Limestone can actually buffer a little bit in that small intestine, which can help out with that subclinical type acidosis issue. But it's our main go-to calcium supplement. Um, it's calcium carbonate, generally, is one the best one to use. Molasses or vegetable oils, we generally don't use a lot of these in the sheep side, um, and if they are used, it's mainly to improve palatability or keep your dust levels down, um, and usually about two to three percent, so 20 to 30 sort of litres per tonne of um, feed is, is enough. Um, they will give you some energy benefits and that sort of thing, but um, yeah, mainly used, mainly because of cost and that to, um, to sort of improve that palatability and keep your dust down. Urea, it's the last one I'll actually talk about. Uh, it's non-protein nitrogen. It's actually used by the bugs in the gut to produce uh, microbial protein. We need to make sure we've got enough energy in the ration. You may need to have potassium and sulfur additives put in as well. It does take a little while for the bugs in the gut to acclimatise to that extra nitrogen, if you like, and it is dangerous stuff. I'm not a big fan of using it. Um, I would certainly be very careful using it with young stock. Um, dry stock, uh, yeah, you may get away with it, but just be really careful with it, uh, particularly if your block or lick, um, even if you're making it yourself, um, does get wet because they can actually um, lead to urea poisoning. I've been putting these up for years. These are some ideas for loose licks. Um, as I said before, I'd love to see all our minerals go on um, go on our grain, but I'd also advocate that we put out a loose lick. If they use it, great. If they don't, well and fine. And I cannot explain why at times they'll smash them. Uh, other times I won't touch them. We don't really know why.
But look, the go-to one normally is two parts lime, two parts salt, one part cause mag to give us calcium, sodium, magnesium. Unfortunately, with cause mag, it's quite bitter. Um, and we can have issues with that when mixing that. But we could also use that same sort of mix, but include some gypsum, which will put a, a little bit of sulfur into the system. A one-to-one -one dolomite salt, loose lick, will provide calcium, magnesium, and sodium. Um, a one-to-one -one acid buff salt mix does the same. Um, and again, is a very good buffer. And again, we can add a little bit of gypsum just to keep the sulfur levels up, which is pro probably more important for our wool-based enterprise. Um, like a merino system. Okay, just um, health and welfare before we get into some early weaning stuff. I'm not going to go through too many of these, but these are the sort of issues we can sort of expect when we have long-term feeding in the dry sort of periods. Acidosis, coccidiosis, all sheep have coxy. Cox, coxy. Um, it's when they're stressed uh, that we really start to see issues with that um, coccidiosis. Rectal prolapse, there's urolithiasis or water belly, bladder stones. Respiratory diseases, windy, dry, dusty, pneumonia and pleurisy can show up. Skin and eye diseases like pink eye and scabby mouth. Neurological and lameness, polyencephalomalacia, which is basically a long-term feeding issue, um, but we can see that at times. Um, laminitis, which is like founder in horses, it's an early sign or a sign of acidosis. We have some miscellaneous stuff like buying in or using mouldy feeds um, or any feeds that are high in mycotoxins, which can cause some health issues. But the three I've sort of thought we'd look at is this grain poisoning. Um, we prefer to use the term acidosis, but it's also known as grain poisoning, grain overload, engorgement. We've already sort of covered it. It's basically a rapid starch fermentation. That photo of the lungs on the right-hand side there, I took that photo when I was called out to a producer's place who put lambs on a mixture of grains and they gorged themselves. And um, yeah, basically what happens first and foremost, you get all this gas and foam being produced in the room and then they can't belt it out and they die of asphyxiation. They can't breathe. So if you get to them early enough, you can actually um, hopefully do something about it. Now, <clears throat> Ways of treating acidosis is try to feed hay, but they're really not going to want to eat once, once they've got a bit of a gut issue. But um, antacids like magnesium hydroxide, you try and get those into the system. Maybe some oral electrolytes. The first thing I advocate, and we did this uh, when I went to that producer's place when I showed that photo of the lungs. Those lambs that we thought were going to die, we hit with bicarb in water, which is the go-to sort of one that they generally advocate. Um, the ones that we thought that we thought were going to live, um, we hit them with that. The ones we thought were the worst ones, we hit them with oil, just some vegetable oil. And by and large, those lambs that we drenched with vegetable oil survived because those gas and foam was able to be belts out. Another one that um, you can try using is a dishwashing water solution um, and drench them with that. So I'm not a big fan, I didn't put it in there, but I'm not a big fan of bicarbon water. What happens when you put water with bicarb? You produce gas. Um, all it's really trying to do is to get that acid levels in check. Um, we'll be worried about that later on. Let's keep the animal alive first up by getting the, you know, belching out the gas uh, and the foam. Uh, this bladder stones, urolithiasis, um, water belly, more common in weathers and rams. Basically, it usually comes about when we have long term imbalanced feeding of calcium relative to phosphorus. Um, can also um, happen when stock have been grazing certain plants and they can have a calcium or an induced calcium deficiency in the system. Um, basically what happens, stones form in the urine, uh, block the bladder and the bladder bursts, right? And you can, can't do anything but really euthanize that animal. You try to prevent by keeping your calcium supplements up, um, acid salts, ammonium chloride and that, possibly use those, keep your fibre levels up. Make sure we've got good quality water and keep uh, salt levels up, you know, upwards of 4% of um, salt in the diet. The last one we'll just touch on is prolapse, which again tends to happen with longer term type feeding. Um, but also if you've got short dock tails, and we've got a bit of an issue with that in the industry where people do dock tails too short. Dusty conditions, if the animal's fat, 
not enough fibre, leads to constipation, coughing and that sort of thing, and you can have issues like a, a rectal prolapse. Okay, I'm just going to finish off now and, and go through the benefits of early weaning. Um, this I'm only concentrating on sheep with this one, but uh, we'll just go through these. I know uh, there's another one being run in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but look, the benefits of early weaning, the, the main one really is, is you can start to really cater for the individual animal. So you reduce your over, overall DSC rating by about a third. So you take that U from a high DSC rating to a dry sheep rating, and you can concentrate on pushing the lambs. Um, importantly, young stock are not out there starting to or wanting to compete for the pasture or the grain base that we're giving. Um, the ewes aren't required to continually produce milk because the lambs are still suckling. Um, and you just provide the best feed to the younger stock um, and try and push them along. Just if we look at the milk curve, that's that black line there, and milk production in sheep normally um, peaks around three or four weeks after the lamb is born. Um, our pasture intake there, younger lambs will tend to graze earlier during poor conditions because um, they're really starting to compete and they're probably not getting enough milk from mum anyway. By about eight weeks of age, so around about um, 10 weeks after the first lamb hits the deck, um, lambs are generally consuming more pasture than they are milk. Um, they're getting more out of the pasture than they are mum's milk. So all they're doing is dragging mum down and 12 weeks of age is the optimum age to wean a lamb. So you can early wean. We used to wean down to three to four weeks of age, but you need good quality feed to do so. You can successfully wean around eight to 10 weeks of age. And as long as we keep those lambs going forward, they do okay. So that 12 weeks, if you've got a five or six week joining period, is about 14 weeks after the first lamb hits the deck. As I said, you can wean earlier than that, um, but you need to ensure high quality feeds out and available. So minimum target weights, I like to say 15 kilos for the Merino and 18 kilo for crossbreed lambs. That's a bare minimum I'd like to see at weaning time. <clears throat> recommendations generally are from industry, and a lot of these recommendations come out of the winning with weaners um, uh, workshops run by AWI, which are really are a good workshop. Um, we like to target about 45% of the mature weight of the ewe. So to give you some idea, if your ewes are 50 kilos, we target 23 kilo live weight for those lambs at weaning time. If the ewes are 60 kilos, we're looking at 27 kilos. So that's quite hard to get in a normal year. So, but they are the, um, the target ranges. And importantly, and this comes from some really good work that um, Sue Hatcher did. Um, in the southern and central tablelands, looking at uh, monitoring a couple of the farms. Um, they found that small increases in growth rate post weaning can dramatically improve survival rates. So yes, the weight at, le at weaning time is critical, but having those lamps go forward post weaning is also critical when it comes to survival rates. Give you some idea here, if you look at this curve, survival rates on the left-hand axis here, we're looking here at a 55 kilogram ewe, so the target for the lamb weaning weight is 25 kilos. Lambs that are around 14 or 15 kilos, survival rates are only going to be about 80%. If we can actually keep them going forward, that pushes their survival rates up to about you know, 95% or so. Okay, this is some of the work that uh, I said Sue had to um, had done uh, flocks in the southern and central tablelands. We were looking at four percentiles, if you like, there, four groups of, uh, of the lamb, lamb categories. This one on the left-hand side is the lightest 25% of lambs, um, and they are twice as likely to die, merely because they are lighter lambs. But again, we can overcome a lot of that by having them going forward. How do we do that? If you haven't got the pasture because we're in drought, well, we need to supplement you feed and the like. And imprinting, and this is something we should do every year. We've had two really good years in the last two years, and I don't know how many people would still have been imprinting stock. Um, but I would advocate you do it every year. So it's basically because those lambs learn from mum. They learn to, to recognise grains and recognise feed troughs or self-feeders or even water troughs. Mum teaches them. Okay, so... Because sheep are what's called neophobic, they're scared of new things, and it's quite hard to actually get them onto 
new grains in particular if they haven't actually been trained onto them. So there are huge benefits for pre-training lambs prior to weaning and basically all we need to do is run out three or four feeds over the two weeks prior to weaning. We don't need, if we're not feeding normally, we don't need to actually give them a full feed, as little as 50 grams per ewe, just to drag that ewe to the trail. So she brings her lambs to the trails. And we wanna make sure about 90% of the lambs are actually feeding by the time we finish this introduction or pre-training of the lambs. Now, this is some work that was done back in the 80s um, at UNE, and it really does show the benefits of training lambs. There were three three groups. We had a control group. I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, there's the percentage of lambs eating on days one and five, averaged over five feeding periods over 18 months. So this is over a year and a half time uh, of feeding. The first group, the lambs had not seen wheat at all prior to weaning. The second group, the lambs were given wheat prior to weaning, but mum wasn't with them. And this third group were given wheat prior to weaning with mum. If we look at these on the right hand side here and these blue bars, 90 to 95 percent of the lambs that were pre trained by mum to recognise wheat as a grain or as a feed went to the feed within the first one to five days. Okay, and it's just a massive and it's a lifelong, lifelong um, learning experience for them. What I like to actually recommend is if you can, uh, if we're doing this sort of thing, provide a shotgun mix because some trial work has really shown that if you use one particular grain, yes, lambs will go to that, that grain earlier, later in life. Um, and that it'll take a little bit longer for them to go to other grains like barley, oats and corn, um, but they will go quicker to those and to say wheat compared to lambs that, had, um, that hadn't been sort of pre-trained to it. So if you've got a couple of grains on hand, lupins, some pulses or some cereal grains, I'd just do a mix of it so they, they're exposed to a, a variety of grains to start with. Okay, we're almost finished. Another one that a lot of people probably should be using is creep feeding areas or giving access maybe to some pasture um, through a fence line or a gate area or a fenced off area that you provide good quality feed to, so only the lambs can actually access that feed, so we're not feeding the ewe per se, um, and then, therefore we're reducing our costs. Right? It also takes a bit of pressure off the ewe, so it reduces the demand for her on, on feed, uh, both pasture and grain based. And these are the sort of things you can do. This is generally we look at um, 10 to 12 inch sort of gaps and about a bar about 18 inches high off the ground, so lambs can access, say, a self feeder in this case. Or if you had a, a something like this, or even getting just some um, steel posts across the gateway, where they might access um, some pasture or something that won't handle the whole flock, but um, lambs can sort of certainly get some benefit from. It's important to remember that every day of weight loss during weaning, it'll take three days to put it back on. So let's minimise as much stress as we can. How do we do that? We can look at returning lambs to their lambing paddock. Normally we wouldn't advocate that because of the risk of, <coughs> excuse me, high worm burdens on that pasture. But the lambs know the paddock. They know the watering points. They know the better grazing areas and the like. So that takes a lot of stress out of the lambs. You might consider split weaning where you go in and you wean over two or three periods. So you wean heavier lambs initially and then you wean your lighter lambs maybe two weeks later. Those lighter lambs may be late born twin lambs, okay? So we give them a bit more time with mum. More and more people are looking at crossword. with mums, and that then again takes a lot of stress away. You say 5% older show them of running with the one the birds and the mob just to help feed or boring something else we don't do for much of it industry um yard weaning uh actually uh to foster water and humans and dogs and um and a feeding or a performer or feed long type situation so we should do more okay in summer 
we should more an efficient reduction. We want to see drives know what our in particular levels are and so is up. We want to maintain fibre in the system to keep whole room and functioning properly. We need to know what the animals feed needs are and we need to meet them, meet them. And to do that you need to monitor body condition score. So keep a good, good eye on how those ewes in particular are going, particularly if they have lambs at foot. Um, and again, as soon as you make the decision to wean, you can just focus all your energies on the lambs um, and take those ewes back to a dry um, ewe or dry animal type situation. Here we go, Jeffrey. Very good, thank you, Jeffrey. We um, we did have a little bit of audio issue there through through in a couple spots there, but um, I think we made it through okay. Not much we can actually do about that. I think it was a bit of instability with you all with some internet connection there. Um, yeah, very good. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. One, um, one around fibre. Um, how broad does a fibre need to be to form an effective fibre mat? Um, would chaff be effective or is it too fine? No, the, the, I don't know where this recommendation come from, but when I was in the department, the recommendation was 25 mils, so an inch long. So that's an additional yep. cost of processing. And they'll chew it up. They chew it up. So uh, to my mind, it's, it could go in a foot long, um, but they'll, they'll chew it up A, as it goes through, and B, when they chew the cut. So uh, it's just got to be some sort of roughage that's going to stimulate that rumen. Yep. Yep. Great. Um, another question here. And um, Henry, Henry says that this might be a dumb question, but I'll tell Henry that there's no dumb questions. Only ones that are dumb are the ones you don't ask. So, um, Henry's new to ag and he just wanted to, he's got a question around water um, and how important is water in the equation? Yeah, we didn't cover that, mate. We covered a lot of stuff, obviously, but look, water's critical. It, again, is a big issue when we run into dry um, conditions. You've got to provide good, clean, quality water. Um, be really mindful of boggy dams. Um, the real benefit of confinement feeding really comes in um, when water. Uh, quality becomes a big issue. Um, so if you can confine them and actually provide them with some good, clean quality water, that's that's always you know the recommendation for sure. Yeah, it, it, it's Got difficult it. one, mate, Jeff, because as you know, you you know you might have salinity issues, pH issues, all these sort of things. You may not be able to do much with the water that you have on hand. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just important, that particularly in a confinement area, that you have two to three days worth of water on hand. Sheep, depending on on their size, what they're eating, and, and the like, um, and even like things like salt intake and, and you know, high roughage intake is, is basically going to lead to a, an increase in actual requirements for water. The rough rule of thumb is around two and a half to three times what they eat a day is what they'll drink, but um, they'll probably be upwards of about five litres each a day. Yeah. And yeah, probably the number one recommendation around water is uh, actually get it tested and know know what your quality actually is. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Homebred sheep tend to tolerate sort of poorer quality waters a lot more, uh, better than sheep that are brought in. Um, yeah. But yeah, by all means, if you are concerned, um, I mean, if you wouldn't drink it, I wouldn't wouldn't expect the sheep to drink it, to be honest. So, but boggy dams are just an eternal issue when we come into sort of dry dry times or drought. Um, and can be a, a real problem. Yeah. Um, so Jeff, you've, you've mentioned some treatments for acidosis uh, for sheep. Would that work for cattle also? Pretty much, pretty much. Um, cattle tend to bloat more than sheep, so they're more likely to um, puncture the room to try and get rid of a lot of that sort of gas and foam that they have in in, um, in the room. And so, but, um, yeah, that causes its own problems too, and I'm not a big fan of doing it for sheep or cattle. But it, look, it should well work. Um, keeping an oil component out, um, they can self-medicate. Uh, I don't believe sheep and cattle know what they need at times, but they have actually shown that you know, there's been trial work with sheep that's shown if they've got a bit of a gut problem like acidosis, they'll preferentially go and eat bicarb. And the same is with your know, light vegetable oils and the like. Um, if they're bloating, they'll tend to go and actually consume some oil. 
So it might be something you, you know, you may consider actually putting a drum of oil out there or something for um, just to try and prevent that that uh, gas and foam issue that sort of the first real reason why an animal will die from acidosis. Yeah, great. Um, this question, I'm sure you'll be able to answer it, but you may want to take it on notice. Uh, the mixing rate of bicarb and water for the treatment of acidosis, do you have a, a mixture recipe? Oh, I can't remember offhand, mate, sorry, no. Um, yeah, that's all right, yeah, we can look that one up. If, um, yeah, it can, can be looked up, it's certainly on the EPI and LLS sort of websites. Um, as I said, I'm not a big fan of it because the first and foremost is, is all that gas and that we've got to get that out of the system first and then worry about the acid being produced, right? So, yeah, um, yeah I'd rather hit them with veg oil and then sort of, yeah, look at getting some bicarb or something into the system. Yeah, I've, I've seen vegetable oil be very effective and it'd be the first thing I would walk, walk um, grab off the shelf, I think. Yeah. Um, question here from Jamie Lee. If the ewes have never been fed grain, uh, but lambs need to be imprinted, are there any extra steps that you need to con be considered when first feeding these ewes that have never been fed grain? That's a good question. Um, as I said, I'd rather see stock imprinted even in a good year, because we certainly come around where we, we need to feed stock. And if they haven't been trained to grain, it can be a real problem. If you have some mature stock or older stock that um, you can actually mix in with that particular mob to actually drive them or take them through onto the trail, but um, that'd be good. But a lot of times it's just perseverance, actually run that trail out and just continually push them onto it. Yep, yep, and even maybe um, pulling them into a smaller paddock, even uh, and while you do that too, would help. Yeah, oh, certainly. Even if it was just a feeding area. Uh, where you put them yep. in and they just need that contact with that grain. Um, yep. But it's it's silly. I mean, I've seen lambs not eat lucent because they'd never seen it as, as a feed. Uh, so yep. we need to train them. We do need to train them and mum's the best way of doing it. Great. Um, another question here from Phoebe. Um, hypothetically, is it better to spread out the required daily feed amount over a couple of feeds to improve digestion? To improve digestion, so what, give three days worth of feed in one shot? Uh, no, I think it's more like if your daily feed is, say, uh, a kilo and a half per head, should you feed that in one feeding amount or should you split it over um, more feeds per day, I suppose, more? So, yeah, over the day, which is labour, labour intensive. Labour intensive. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, and I don't generally recommend things, but I'm a bit of a fan of the the automated feeding systems, the troughing systems, uh, for that very reason, that they can put out small amounts throughout the day and night. They can be preset for as many grams every hour. And there are some big benefits for that. Um, as for going and, and yeah, feeding out, say, half the rate twice a day, um, you've just got to be mindful of your time and your mental state. So I would probably, be more likely to run a bigger trail uh, and spread it out. Spread it out, do one good feed, spread it out. Um, again, when I was in New South Wales DPI, the recommendation came that um, you would feed out late afternoon if you had lambing ewes and the like. Um, if you do have stock, you know, if, if you have ewes that are still lambing by chance, well, I wouldn't go anywhere you know, really with a feed cart. Again, I'd rather see them on a self-feeder type system, but if you had to do it, I'd do a, a nice long sort of semi-circuit or a circular trail. Um, so those ewes with lambs at foot, the lambs are never far away from the ewe. I wouldn't just do one long, long, long trail, but um, I'd certainly spread it out um, and make those sheep work for it. Yep, yep. Or, or the luxury of an auto feeding system um, would be a, an interesting bit of research there of what the benefits of that might be with those auto feeders. Uh, yeah, I think there's some huge benefits to be found there. So for that very reason, of, instead of that slug feed where they go bang and they get that three quarters of a kilo of grain, it won't go, even, even if the rumours are climatised to it, it's, it's still a hell of a shock. Um, yeah. I think there are real benefits in getting just small amounts throughout the day. Yeah. 
Now, um, another question here. So the lambs have been weaned now for four weeks. Can I return them to the ewes and uh, do some grain imprinting with the ewes? Good point. Um, look, I'd, I'd say yes. I'd say yes. Um, they're going to recognise the mum for sure, but mum should have dried up well and truly by now. Um, yeah, I would. I could do that. Um, depends on whether, I guess, what sort of situation. Are we talking a crossbred lamb that you're going to try and finish for for sale or are we talking about um, self-replacing type merinos or something? But um, because you've still got yeah two different needs, I don't know what sort of um, pastor situation that person has at the moment. But um, yes, it'd be handy for the lambs being taught what a grain is. Um, or you know, feeders, troughing, all that sort of thing. Um, but are the lambs actually going to get what we need to give them if they're back in with adult sheep? Yeah, so that's a crossbred system they've just added in. All right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Very good. Um, I hope that answered that question. And look, we're, about, we're at the end of this current questions. Um, anything else you wanted to add in, Jeff, before we um, we wrap things up? Um, well, we just seem to go through this in the cycle, Jeff, as you know. Um, I'm more than happy if people have questions and like just to give us a tingle, uh, give us a ring, and um, I'm, I'm happy to sort of help out and, and try and keep your chin up. Um, I will say that I've definitely seen in the last couple of months with all the talk of El Nino and the the way the season's gone, that people have been more proactive this time round. Um, 2019 drought really shocked a lot of people, I think. So uh, a lot of people have already sort of gone down to bare bones, if you like. Um, one thing I've certainly seen over my years in the job is that um, producers are that much more professional and that much better at feeding sheep. They've really learned how to sh how to feed. So. If we need to fine tune that sort of thing, there's plenty of people like yourself, Jeff, other staff and LLS, DPI or other consultants that are more than happy to help. Yep, always here for, for questions at any time. Um, there, there's just a little question for me, actually, probably from Rachel, um, is it possible to gain access to the webinars that we've done prior to this? Uh, Rachel, yes, um, you can go, jump on where you've registered for this one and you can register for all and um, each one individually, I should say, and you'll get the uh, recordings um, emailed to you. Uh, they're also on uh, available on our YouTube channel and they will be mostly on our um, social media accounts, Facebook and those sorts of things as well. So yes, they they, they will be available. Um, if you have any problems getting access to it, uh, just shoot uh, myself um, an email and we can we can get that sorted out for you. Anyway, Jeff, thanks very much for your um, presentation tonight, some great information. Um, and I think one of the key things that I took away is try to keep it simple um, don't overcomplicate things and there are lots of, some basic ways of keeping things cost effective and not too um, complicated when we're feeding sheep in dry times. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you for your time and um, yeah, be sure to log in and for next week's one on feeding cattle in dry times um, and, and some future events that we're still just in the planning phase but there will be more. If you anything you want us to cover, um, let us know and we'll see what we can work out. Anyway, thank you, Jeff. And yeah, thanks, Jeff. Good luck, everyone. Okay, thank you. Cool. Cool.